Just to give you a little bit of background, in January 2021, our UK commissioned a major piece of work, a uh, piece of research, very much in partnership with the Arts and Humanities Research Council, who funded the work. This work was undertaken by um, the evidence-based team. And we're going to hear from Pete Dalton uh, during this session. Evidence-based is a research consultancy, which is based at Birmingham City University. And that work has explored the role and potential of academic libraries, archives and museums in and as leaders of the production of work and of scholarly research and academic activity. Now, this project has explored the extent to which libraries and archives and museums were already involved in research partnerships with members of the academic community and the nature of these and any challenges and barriers. And I think we'll talk a little bit about those as we go through that have been experienced during the creation and what the potential is to strengthen our role in research. Now, the project has also looked across the range of activities taken and looked at the potential for growth and uh, developing where we are now by considering the role of libraries and archives and museums as um, leaders in research in their own right. And that's drawing on the vast knowledge and skill in a whole range of ways, uh, curatorial, uh, uh, computing, uh, technical, conservation, all sorts of range of professional skills that we know that go up to make the research library, and all of which add as knowledge and expertise profoundly important in the production of knowledge uh, and in the research activities of which we're a part. Now, it's fair to say this has been a highly ambitious project uh, set against a very demanding timeline. Uh, so I would like to give credit uh, before we go on to anything else to those who have contributed to this work. I'd actually like to say uh, a thank you first to, um, to Matt Greenall and to the AHR, I'm sorry, to the Research Libraries UK executive team who've done an absolutely amazing job uh, through the last six months. I'd particularly like to thank, of course, our colleagues in the AHRC, some of whom are joining us today, including Tao Chang and Christopher Smith. Uh, and also to the fantastic team at Evidence Base, based at Birmingham City University, who have conducted this work so thoroughly, uh, with such care to uh, the needs of um, keeping to a timetable, and in providing such a comprehensive set of results and recommendations. And we're going to hear more about those today. For me, this is a really special event. Um, I am passionate about the role of uh, research libraries. I've worked my whole career in the context of research libraries in, in, in universities. Uh, and I think the opportunity to be exploring our own practice uh, and to be considering how we can grow that and develop it and push through some of the barriers and seize the opportunities that are ahead of us is, is one of the most exciting that I've had uh, in my time, in my career. So I'm really hoping that we have a good discussion today and, and push ourselves and push ourselves forward. This is intended to be quite an interactive session. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the long table aspect of that as we come towards that section. We're going to get to that long table following some context setting. Um, I'm going to give a few opening uh, reflections um, as our UK chair on this work uh, and then pass over to uh, Professor Christopher Smith, who is the executive chair of, of the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Uh, Christopher, we're so pleased you can join us. And to Pete Dalton, who is the project lead for Evidence Base, who's going to give us some really concrete um, insights to what the findings and recommendations of the research have been. And then we will go into the long table, which has a starry cast of panellists and a starry audience, which we hope you will, uh, you know, move from audience into panelists and kind of join the conversation. Um, it's really meant to be about your input and your engagement today. And so please do use the, um, the Q&A function if you are staying in feed loop, but also the chat function if you are in Zoom. And we will be kind of gathering questions and, and contributing those to the panel discussion. We will get to that after the uh, presentation from Pete, and I'm going to talk at that point about the housekeeping realities of the long table. Before I get to that, uh, this is a, a reminder, if uh, you didn't hear me at the beginning, the, the nature of this interactive session is best experienced through Zoom. So if you are still on the Feedloop pl platform and you just want to view and listen, that's absolutely fine. But if you'd like to contribute uh, more accurately, Actively, then please do swap onto the Zoom channel, and that is through the grey button underneath the feed loop um, viewing box uh, on that platform. It'll take you straight into this Zoom, uh, and that will make it much more participatory if you'd like to kind of come into the conversation, and I really hope you will. So just before I hand over to Christopher, I'd just like to give a couple of my own uh, reflections on what's been behind this study. 
safety and why it matters. Uh, the first is actually a thank you, um, because as well as those I've mentioned who have been actively putting the research together uh, and, and conferring on recommendations, the evidence base, uh, as people tell us, from which this uh, report has been written is thanks to you. So many of the uh, community um, uh, from libraries, from archives, from museums, from independent research organisations, from universities, from university senior leaders, from academics, early career researchers and funders, all of you have contributed through town halls, surveys, structured interviews uh, uh, and other ways in which you have helped to shape uh, the findings and that gives us a really strong basis I think for the findings and for the recommendations, some of which have already been posted on the Research Libraries UK website and you can get an early taste of those by following links that have been circulated through social media in order to have a look at the, the recommendations that have come forward so far. For me, the level of participation in this research really spoke about the appetite and sense of um, opportunity and possibility, and let's be honest, not yet always fully realised, uh, to strengthen the role of research libraries and library staff as participants in the production of knowledge and in the research process and the making of new knowledge. We know that is at the heart of our practice in archives, museums and libraries, uh, but it's important to be able to evidence that and to build on what we do already. As part of that study, we've therefore shared our experience. Um, we've also shared challenges and barriers and opportunities and together helped to shape the recommendations that we're gonna hear more about. Now, these are designed to have a practical impact uh, and really um, to help drive that ambition for libraries and of course, always for excellent research in the arts and humanities. We know that libraries, archives, museums are labs for the humanities and the arts and many, many other subjects. We know that our staff support uh, interdisciplinarity and, um, and, and, and research across many, many different subjects. And we know that arts and humanities is, is, is a profoundly important part of what we do. Libraries are people places, they're places for conversation. Uh, and their places of collaboration. Uh, you know, we're a long way from any uh, concept of being a kind of a, a warehouse of books. We're places where challenge and inspiration uh, should happen and critical conversations. Uh, and that is born both of the services, collections and spaces that we provide online and on site, but most of all from the people and who we are and the conversations that we come into. Uh, now, research is too often framed, particularly in the humanities, as, as the kind of the, 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 the place of the kind of the lone scholar. But the truth is, it's often social and very often collaborative. And the participants who are touching, catalyzing, shaping, influencing, and sometimes leading that research come in many, many different shapes and sizes and backgrounds. Uh, and not all of them have research uh, as part of their formal contract. So this study has been a way to explore those different touch points and those different contributions. And I very much hope that what it leads to is a, a stronger seizing of those roles and that you know, significant contribution and recognition for the role that library staff, archives, museums play in partnering and leading in research. And if I may, I also take heart this year from the findings of this report. We've been through so much disruption as a community, museums, libraries and archives. And it's been challenging to the research lives of those we work with, as well as in our own working and home lives. So I would urge us to take this report and recommendations as an opportunity to go forward and to see where we want to take our future after this very difficult time in framing, developing and really building on the role of libraries, archives and museums in research. With that, I'm going to ask um, Christopher Smith from the UKRI, uh, Chief Executive, or, so I'm sorry, Executive Chair of the Arts and Humanities Research Council, who's going to uh, generously give his reflections on this research. Steve, Christopher, open to you. Yes, thank you. Um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, um, technology is, is, is functioning as one, of course, would expect uh, in a group of, of librarians. Um, I am absolutely thrilled to be here and I want to thank Jess uh, and everyone who has invited me, uh, but I would particularly like to thank RLUK partners and the community that have contributed to this report with such an impressive and um, full response. Uh, it's, uh, it's 
brilliant to see such a wealth of information that's come through and the sheer volume of participants is indicative of the urgency and importance uh, of this report and its findings. I'd like to add my thanks straight away also um, to the team at AHRC that have contributed to this, uh, but rather more um, profoundly, I'd like to thank everybody in the library community, wherever you sit, uh, for what you have done to support students and researchers through this exceptionally difficult period of time. I know that our librarians have done a huge amount um, of additional work, um, huge hours put in, rising to extraordinary challenges, digitization at pace, uh, trying to find new ways of getting information to students, doing so often uh, against really difficult personal circumstances themselves. And that goes absolutely all the way across the piece from university libraries to our great national collections. This has been incredibly difficult and challenging for everybody. But the fact of the matter is that our research has continued. We have been able to support students, researchers, well, you have, uh, and all of us have benefited from the extraordinary strides that you've made over past years and rapidly past months. I am only one of the executive chairs of UKRI. Every single executive chair is hugely aware of what you have done. It doesn't matter what subject you're in. Uh, Arts Humanities is, is my area, but sciences depend absolutely on the information which flows through universities. So thank you so very much for everything you've done. And I really hope that as we move forward, not only will there be some degree of normality return so that you can get back to uh, patterns of working that you find familiar, but also that we learn from this experience and we all support you to take uh, the learning forwards, because there are many things that I know have happened in libraries that librarians probably have wished had happened a long time ago. Uh, we mustn't lose track of the advances that you've been able to make with the support that you just had and carry that forward. What we see in the report uh, is, is such a richness of activity that is needed, agendas that are urgent, opportunities that are possible. The, one of the recommendations sits around wealth of expertise. Uh, no surprise to me, of course, um, or anybody here, but it, just that real depth and richness that is exemplified here, just how much skill and capacity and extraordinary specialist knowledge is sitting within uh, our libraries. And of course, the challenges, uh, making sure that these, this really complex and utterly transformed thing, which is a library, uh, virtual, physical, um, a, a producer as well as a gatherer of research is genuinely really fully, fully understood within university uh, settings and funders more generally. That's a great challenge, but I think there are opportunities uh, here to, to continue the work. And I'm, I'm going to try and be brief because I'm hoping to hear from everyone else in the long tables how we take this forward. You all know, I hope, that for the Arts Humanities Research Council, libraries are, and collections are absolutely fundamental to us. We uh, have uh, worked with you incredibly successfully in projects such as Living with Machines and Towards a National Collection. And it's your methodologies and your approaches and your skills that are giving the life and the, the power to these really successful collaborations that open up new avenues of interdisciplinary inquiry, uh, the very intersection of humanities scholarship, data science and research software engineering. These are new frontiers and new horizons where we have so much to offer. I've talked a little bit about this in the past uh, in um, commenting that the paradise is just a huge library. I'm sure it is. Uh, I, I wanted when I um, wrote about libraries in the past to stress this idea of libraries as infrastructures of engagement and the ways in which you foster community. Uh, and that's as true of the tiny municipal library 
uh, as it is of, of the British Library, everything between on the spectrum. It's so important to understand the support that you're giving for people to engage with each other and with knowledge. And that's so important now as we think about what our future looks like. Now, I was really struck by a couple of, of quotes that were in the report. And one of them um, about the way that we should try to help research libraries think of themselves as partners in research, empowering them, well, uh, giving, giving space for the power that you already have to be visible, I think is, is the way I would put that, um, co-creators of knowledge. Um, and uh, the emphasis on the hard work that goes into producing the visible uh, exhibitions uh, and manifestations of all that work, that of course is another way in which you are absolutely like researchers, where there's so much work that goes on uh, at the early stages to produce the article or the book, which is a physical manifestation. There's no difference, it seems to me, between what you do and what researchers do. And that's why, for me, it's so important that we engage with you on the uh, thinking through the technician commitment. Um, UKRI was the first major funder to become a signatory of the technician commitment back in February 2020. But I'm really, really keen to see us think about the way that librarians can see themselves reflected fully in that commitment and that by being reflected in that way, we change our funding processes and we change the way that we think about how we present uh, the absolutely essential contribution of, of libraries, archives and collections to the research ecosystem. This chimes absolutely with Ottilie Laser's view of the uh, 101 voices of the research ecosystem, the importance of recognising everybody as part of the research community. We will be looking very closely at the recommendations that you've made. Uh, I hoped that this would be the beginning of a conversation um, and that we would continue the conversation uh, further on. So I'm really looking forward to uh, the next stages that we have. And I'm really pleased to be able to announce uh, at this conference um, that AHRC will invest immediately £100,000 in professional practice fellowships with RLUK to take forward uh, early stages of the engagement activity, which you so rightly identify as critical to the path forwards. So with that, I'll close with a repeated and reiterated thanks for all the work that's gone into this report, but also everything that you're doing to support us to be the researchers we want to be and support research and innovation that the country needs. Thank you. Christopher, thank you so much. Uh, and I, I'm just thrilled to hear that, uh, you know, responsiveness, generosity, strategic um, kind of uh, engagement with the recommendations of the report through your announcement of those professional um, practice fellowships. I, I don't think we knew what, what to expect as we came to through starting this research, but that is such a fantastic, tangible, strategic response that will, which will mean a great deal to everyone on this call and to all who've contributed to that research as, you know, absolutely practically putting your money where your mouth is in terms of wanting to build this practice area. Thank you. And to all of your team who've been absolutely superb. And I'm personally going to be putting Paradise is just a huge library in one of our merchandising tote bags for the University Library of Cambridge, because uh, I could not agree more. And indeed, the library I know through the pandemic is my home uh, away from home and I know that's true for so many of the researchers and students we support too so huge thank you to you Christopher I'm going to pass on to Pete Dalton now to hear a bit more detail but thank you to you and to the HRC thank you I'm just now going to um, invite uh, Pete Dalton uh, into the room. Um, Pete, uh, welcome. Uh, Pete has done a tremendous job with the team of Evidence Base, working over a very pressured timescale over the last um, six months to produce uh, a fantastic uh, report and set of recommendations absolutely rooted in the evidence that we have been talking to him about and many of his colleagues. Pete is the project lead for Evidence Base, which is uh, a research unit based at the University of uh, Birmingham City University. And it's with great pleasure that I pass to Pete to give us some more concrete insights to this report and his recommendations. Pete. Brilliant. Hello. Thank you for having me here. I'm just going to share my screen um, so I can run through some things. Right. Da -da -da -da. Right, can, can everybody see that? Has that come through yet? It's there, Pete, yes. Brilliant. Okay, so 
thanks for that. And it, it, I mean, this has been a, a really interesting project. I'm personally interested as a, a researcher based in a, a, a library, and I think it's been really useful to shed a spotlight on on all of these issues. And absolutely wonderful that already the recommendations are kind of bearing fruition. So long may that continue. Um, this was a collaborative project itself. So um, although I was leading it, we were working closely with RLUK, AHRC and the wonderful steering group. And I've got a short period of time. So in the spirit of how the project has been delivered at extreme pace, I'm just going to do a whistle stop tour through some of the research to give you some context about how we got to the recommendations that we've, we've got to today. Um, we sought to answer four questions really. So looking at currently how our library staff partners in and leaders of research. And I should just make it very clear at this point that library staff is used as a shorthand throughout this. So referring to um, staff working in academic research libraries, but also museums, galleries, archives. So hopefully this is of relevance to, to most of you, if not all of you here today. Um, we're looking at what the future might be, as well as barriers and some good practice and how those barriers might be, be overcome. We had a very short period of time to do this, relatively speaking, but as Jess said at the intro, we, we did really well you know, in terms of getting widespread engagement between all, all the partners. And there was a, we did town hall events, conference presentations, et cetera. And I think the value of that, apart from getting people engaged in the actual research process was really about um, stimulating the conversation, raising awareness of some of the um, issues around this area and also what might be possible in this area. So that, that's been really useful. and. and the recommendations will ensure that those conversations do, do carry on. Um, in terms of the research, we used a mixed methods approach. So we used survey, a survey, interviews, focus groups, and produced some case studies, which I definitely would refer you to when they are published. Um, it was really important for us to look across the board, really, at, at, at these, these issues. Um, you know, in some senses, when you get down to it, the, the research landscape can be quite complex. There are a number of different actors involved. So we involved library staff, library heads, academics, research facilitators, funders, university leaders to, to get a range of perspectives on, on this. Um, I'm just going to talk briefly about some of the the key headline findings. Obviously, I, I can't do justice to, to all of this in, in 15 minutes, but in terms of how library staff have been involved in, in collaborative or leads in, in research, the, the survey found that uh, roughly a quarter had been involved as a collaborator in a research project over the last five years. Now this could be formally as, as a co-investigator or principal investigator, so somebody named on a bid, but also informally. And the picture varies across institutions, as you might expect, but there is some involvement and there's certainly more that can be done to, to build on that. And there's some really good examples that we've pulled out as case studies of, of how different uh, partnerships have been formed and, and what they've, they've done. The, nature of the research that we did meant that we were mainly more heavily focused on, on shape subjects um, and also in the UK, although we have done international case studies and looked at uh, feedback from overseas. So perhaps un unsurprisingly, the partnerships that we identified centered around arts and humanities, history, etc. Um, and also tended to focus around collections-based research, which again isn't surprising where most of the sample of interviewees of survey participants were from research intensive universities who have special collections. So as well as those types of skills, there was also evidence of diversifying skills and more digital scholarship type uh, activity. So there's a whole range of um, skills and evidence that uh, libraries bring to research projects. And I'll just say I've, I've peppered this with some nice quotes from the uh, report because I think that 
we, we got a, a lot of good voices from the interviews that we did. Um, without doubt, really, the survey respondents felt that there were, there were considerable benefits of library staff being involved in, in research as active researchers, so whether that's collaboratively or as leads. Um, and this table really says it all, so benefits hugely to HE and knowledge in general, also institutional, for example, reputational benefits for library services themselves and also individual benefits as well. I think that's important to, to bear in mind. Um, on the right there is a long list, which I wouldn't expect you to read, but we didn't do a, a skills audit as part of this. However, coming through was just the whole range of skills that, that library staff can bring to, to projects. And, and I think the notion that there's a certain complementarity with what library staff can bring and what academics can, can bring. So the, definitely working together is really beneficial. And I think going back to what's been said before, you know, the library can occupy a sort of quite a special place in terms of encouraging engagement, being a conduit for collaboration. And that's, that's come through in the research that we've, we've done. One thing that I wanted to pick up at this stage was really around recognition. And this, this has come up both in the engagement activities, the discussions there, as well as the research itself. And there's a notion that perhaps to some extent, the contribution of library staff to, to research isn't fully recognized. Now, for example, obviously, if somebody is less formally involved in a project, there's a higher chance that they may not be fully recognized. Um, but also things can happen with how a library is involved you know at stages of, of the project so if they're not costed into a bid or put in bidding stage that might kind of get forgotten for further down the line i think what's really been interesting is um notions around definition of what constitutes research and um that can actually Call, result in a lack of recognition. So for example, cataloging was mentioned as an example, you know, where does that become research or a contribution to research? And is that fully recognized as that? And I think um, this is something, a perception that's actually with both some library staff who may not think that what they're doing is, is actually contributing to research um, as, as well as some academics. So there's, there's kind of work there to be, be done. Um, and also sometimes REF, for example, formal recognition structures may not always include what library staff are involved in. So I've put here, again, this is purely speculative on, on my part, but there, there could well be a lot more going on than we're aware of if people aren't recognising, you know, the value that they contribute to, to research. And as Christopher's mentioned, the technician commitment, um, Initiatives like that, the hidden ref, et cetera, all aim to increase recognition appropriately. And we did ask about this on the survey and, and the level of awareness was, was fairly low and of those people um, understanding its relevance was fairly low. So again, one of the recommendations is around increasing that messaging, making sure that it is relevant and understood. Um, we asked about the future in terms of how likely library staff were to be involved in research over the next 18 months and in all cases in, including academics as partners there was a perception that that would increase and and that could be based on the conversations that we're having um, as part of the engagement activities because I think I think um, people have been a bit more sort of open to what might be possible. So that, that's really positive. And I think we, we may well see that if we provide the opportunities, if we raise awareness of what's possible and also address some of the barriers that we've identified. Um, I'm gonna go on to those barriers now. And again, I can't do justice to, to all of them in, in this period of time, but just choosing a few. What, one thing that came out again, all through the research was certain misperceptions about eligibility and experience for UKRI funding. Um, so for example, believing that library staff may not be eligible to be a co-I or a PI. Um, 
also with experience that they have to have a, P a PhD, which again, it isn't actually the case. So we've already um, seen a lot of myth busting around that in, in the conversations that we've, we've had. But again, clearly some messaging needs to, to be done there to make sure that people understand they're eligible and, and there is no, no barrier there. The, another one I've mentioned here is knowledge and confidence. So again, depending on the nature of involvement in research, this, this can be of relevance. And the staff in the survey, um, not insignificantly, some rated themselves limited or very limited in, in some areas that you'd think would be really useful for um, managing and conducting research projects. So I think, again, there's a certain element of capacity and development there that, that could be useful. And alongside that, there was evidence that levels of confidence of, of library staff as active researchers does vary. And again, it's it's not surprising that those who had, had been involved in research projects in the last five years rated themselves much higher on these things. So there is that kind of um, link between getting the experience and increasing skills. The last point here really covers a whole host of things. Um, and it's really about things such as processes and perceptions. So, um, for example, we we've that in other research there's been evidence that libraries are moving more away from a more passive support role for research to a more active role. And again, that that can influence the extent to which library staff will be active researchers. And I think that there's a lot of perceptual issues around this, both from library staff as um, you know, how they perceive their, their own role and what they are able to be involved in, but also academic staff, whether they perceive the role of, of library staff as active, collaborative partners, in some case leads. So again, it's not across the board, but it can be an issue of, of perception. And the good thing about perceptions is they, they, they can be changed. I think other things are around processes, how, how we find time, capacity to give library staff time to write bids, to get involved in research. So there's, there's a range of, of things there that um, hopefully we can begin to overcome. On the other side, um, through the research, we saw examples of um, a number of things that were happening that actually supported or enabled, facilitated engagement in research. And again, we haven't done a comprehensive audit of this. This list is by no means com comprehensive. But there are, we've seen examples of where um, contracts have been varied, maybe hybrid academic library contracts, where research support for libraries bidding for research has been embedded in the library or dedicated, um, where library staff are very visible in terms of their research interests, priorities, etc. So there's a whole host of things that um, could be could be termed good practice. And I think the, the thing about the whole of this area is there, there is no one size fits all. Every institution, every library starting from wherever it is right now. But these are things that, that could be considered and hopefully built upon. Um, you have access to uh, a version of the recommendations. So we've We've made 13 far reaching recommendations really broadly around capacity building, skills development, engagement, advocacy, um, improving recognition. So a whole host of, of things there. And I think it's important to consider when we consider the complex landscape for research that there's a, a lot of uh, stakeholders that, that can be engaged in making this a reality. Um, enhancing the already wonderful contribution of, of libraries to research and to uh, build build on that foundation and, and improve it going forward. So that's a link to the page for the, the scoping study and where there'll be more information and the report will be there um, imminently and case studies will be put, put on there over time. So I definitely recommend that uh, you, you take a look at that. So that's all I have to say, and it was very, uh, very uh, whistle stop tour of uh, six, five months of uh, intense research. But hopefully, that's got you to uh, understand where we are right now.
Pete, thank you so much. If I can just kind of keep you for a second before you dip your, your video, um, I'd like to say first and foremost, uh, you know, a huge thank you to you because this has been such a pressured piece of work. But uh, as you'll have seen from Christopher Smith's, you know, fantastic announcement uh, in his in his opening words, you know, it's leading to, leading to kind of real world change uh, with, you know, immediate effect. So thank you so much to all of your team. Can I just ask you a question as well? Because I know you're um, not staying on, I think, to, to join the, the panel uh, discussion, um, if, if I'm right in that, Pete. I, I, I'm not sure, but I can do. Okay, okay. Well, let me ask you this question now anyway, to say, um, you know, you will, would have gone into this kind of piece of research and you wouldn't know the nature of kind of asking a research question is kind of quite where it lead, leads. You know, what really surprised you or, or, or um, you know, caught your eye during this this study uh, in terms of kind of reframing the role of research uh, libraries in uh, research outcomes. Well, I, I think positively the, the the kind of goodwill, and I, I think the when we started having those conversations, giving those dialogues in in the uh, conference in a meeting, I, I thought that was so positive in terms of of, of um, people's attitudes, but also. I, I sensed that people started thinking there was more that could be done here, you know, and it was opening up possibilities. I think the the perceptual nature of some of the barriers is, is interesting. Um, definitely around the perceptions about eligibility for funding. I, I thought you know, that that came across so strongly, and again, it's it's not actually true. So um, that's you know one hopefully that can be ticked off fairly easily with with uh, um, some work there. I think in terms of when we when we looked at the case studies, it was really good to get tangible examples of what's going on, and I think um, that's something that I hope will be built on. To I think people enjoy being pointed at other examples of what they might might do, and, and those fulfil that. Um, yeah, I, I, I think on the, yeah on the positive note that it, it's really tackling those those barriers and uh, it, for, as I say from from a researcher in a, in a library myself, you know this hasn't really been looked at uh, at all in any detail, and I've kind of hit those barriers as everyone has in some shape or form. So I think it's really positive to be able to to do that, and um, I think the complementarity as well of what libraries can bring to the table with with academics is really important that's come out as well thank you so much peter that's a great cue as well for the long table section which we're going to move into now so a huge thank you to you for that presentation hugely appreciate it and for all the project work uh, and just to assure um, everyone watching that the uh, the slides um, including uh, pete's presentation the recording of this session will all be published uh, alongside the full report and recommendations in the week beginning the 12th of july so you'll have full access to the findings and the evidence base on which the the recommendations are based so huge thank you to pete uh, really great to have you and to get that sort of first taste of, of the findings here. We're now going to move into the long table uh, section. Um, and again, if I could just uh, remind people, uh, if you haven't already made the move from the feed loop platform uh, direct into Zoom, this would be a good time to do that because uh, only through Zoom will you be able to realize the full interactivity of this section. So again, that, that button is just under the feed loop uh, viewing uh, 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 window uh, in the feed loop platform that takes you a gray button through direct to the Zoom. So do come and join us uh, through the Zoom platform. Um, it would be wonderful to have you join the conversation. Now, many of you will have experienced um, uh, long table um, long tables before um, and um, we but we are experimenting with doing them online and they work really really well uh, the format is, is is really that we have a, a number of panelists and I think that Christopher Smith is with, still with us so if he wants to join us fantastic we're going to invite him as a panelist as well at the opening of our session um, which I'll come to in a moment um, and uh, we are going to uh, have a bit of a conversation as panelists and then very quickly open that up uh, to you all as audience members so just before I bring the table uh, together and, and ask people to introduce themselves um, I'm going to just let you know how you can take part. So if you would like to contribute to the discussion, then there are a couple of ways you can do that. One, which is really simple, of course, is using the chat function. 
uh, in the Zoom itself. And you can use this to ask questions, uh, to raise issues and make comments. Uh, and as chair for the long table, I'll be working really hard to pick up on those and weave them in. So, you know, if you've had a chance to look at the recommendations, tell us what you think, tell us what you're looking for. Uh, if you've got a case study you want to tell us about, then, then you know, use the chat function. And, and if you're willing, I'd love to pull you into the conversation. The other way is to actually join the table. And of course, this is the wonderful thing that we can do with people from all over the world uh, it, through the, uh, the power of Zoom. So if you want to come in, please do raise your virtual hand in from the Zoom, bar, Zoom toolbar. Sorry, it's a, a difficult to say. Um, and my colleagues behind the scenes will help to make sure I know you are there and they will then I can call your name, ask you to put on your camera and your microphone and you will just literally join this conversation. It's a completely informal part of the of DCDC uh, and it works really well uh, if people feel they can come and join in. So um, we'll always have two or three places on the table free uh, and, you know, please do come in. It would be great to hear from you. We're going to kick off now, but if I can ask um, all of those who are here to um, uh, turn on their cameras uh, and uh, delighted again that Christmas is able to join us for this, this start before he has to go off for another meeting. I know at 12.30, absolutely understood. Uh, people come and go during the long table and that's why it works so well. So, so thank you. I'm actually going to start um, by asking each of our uh, panellists to um, give a one minute introduction to themselves and their background and their interest in collaboration. Uh, I'm going to give um, myself and Chris Smith a, a, a pass from that one as we've already uh, done that introduction. Uh, but if I could come around, I'm just going to go through how, as people appear on my screen, if I may. So if I could come to uh, Masood Kirka first, Masood. Thank you very much, Jess. And uh, may I just start by saying thank you, Christopher and Tao, for the wonderful support that AHRC has given to our UK on this report and the findings. Um, my name is Masood Kokar. I'm the University Librarian and Keeper of Relative Collection at the University of Leeds. And I'm also the Vice Chair of Research Libraries UK. Uh, in terms of this project, firstly, I have always been interested in the capability, capacity, and potential of research that can come from libraries. Um, I have been a computer scientist from an educational perspective, and I've seen the, uh, the kind of cross-cutting interdisciplinarity potential that libraries bring uh, as knowledge hubs to the whole research life cycle. But it also felt that it wasn't acknowledged in the same way across the institutions. It also felt that we ourselves didn't feel like we are an active partner in search life cycle. And therefore this report, this collaboration is extremely timely. It's something that really spoke to me and it is something that's going to form the foundations of a fundamental shift in how libraries can be active research partners for the betterment of research and for the culture of research as well. So I think those are the things that I'm genuinely interested in. I'm really looking forward to this long table. Thank you so much, Masood. Brilliant opening. Can I come to Tao Shang next? Tao. Thank you. I'm Tao Chang. I'm Head of Infrastructure at AHRC. Um, my interest in collaboration, I've never been a researcher myself or, or worked as an academic, um, but I've spent quite a lot of my professional time, uh, life helping others um, get their research grants into shape and particularly from working in, um, in museums, university museums, but also um, national museums, I've come to appreciate just how much um, colleagues from collections, libraries can bring to the table. Um, so I'm really, really, really pleased um, to be part of this project and here today. Thank you so much, Tao. Uh, James Baker. Hi, I'm James Baker. I'm a director of the Sussex Humanities Lab at University of Sussex, and I'm incoming director of digital humanities at the University of Southampton. Um, I'm a historian, um, really, but I've also worked in libraries and more recently I'm a serial collaborator with libraries and librarians on research things, pedagogical things, um, and also kind of more administrative things as well. So the lab I currently work in, part of our kind of core team our librarians. So yeah, this project really appealed to me the moment I heard about it. I was delighted to be invited on the steering group. Thank you so much, James, which brings me to Claire Warwick. Hello, um, I'm Claire Warwick. I'm the Professor of Digital Humanities at Durham University. Um, and previous um, 
Pro Vice Chancellor for Research. Um, in that capacity, obviously, I was very much involved in understanding the importance of the work that libraries do in terms of contributing to research. But also in my own practice as a digital humanities researcher, I have a long history of working with libraries and museums um, and special collections um, because digital humanities is so um, interdisciplinary by its nature. I think it's, all, it's almost impossible for us not to want to work um, with librarians and not to find it extraordinarily important. And of course, I was the previous head of the UCL Department of Information Studies, which trains a large number of librarians and always has done over many years. So I was always fascinated and proud to find out what my colleagues, both as academic and practicing librarians were doing and how that interacted with research. So one way or another, um, I have found being on the steering committee really fascinating. Uh, thank you so much, Claire. Sorry, too many buttons all at once. Um, can I come to Joseph Marshall and then to Laurie Taylor and then we'll kick off. Jo Joseph. Thanks, Jess. I'm Joe Marshall. I'm Associate Director of Collections Management at the National Library of Scotland. Um, so I started out following an academic pathway, doing a PhD on the writings of James VI of Scotland. I then moved into cataloguing, curation, then being head of special collections at the University of Edinburgh uh, and now working at the National Library of Scotland. So I've been engaged in research in a number of different capacities. Over the last few years, I've particularly done work with the Wellcome Trust, uh, bringing in research funding for work on collections, whether that's conservation, cataloguing uh, or collection development. Um, so really excited to be part of this conversation and to hear from other people uh, and to see the response to the recommendations of the report. Thanks so much, Joe and Laurie. Yeah, so I'm Laurie Taylor. I'm the Senior Director for Library Technology and Digital Strategies and the Chair of the Digital Partnerships Department at the University of Florida. My role focuses on collaboration. Um, Joe, it's interesting to hear you came through the academic route. Uh, I did as well. I have a PhD in English. My focus was video games. And doing that, what I really learned was that I love working collaboratively to how, how do we make other people's research sing? Coming to libraries, it was really interesting to see that sometimes my library colleagues didn't see the research that they were doing as counting. Um, you know, like, oh, that's not really research. We're, we're helping other people. No, we're actually partners. Um, so we've had some really interesting conversations about it. My passion is sustaining collaborations for building collections, community capacity, and doing all of this for how do we really make collaboration radical and to further our other goals for broader impacts, uh, for the best possible outcomes, um, and to further diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I'm super excited to be here today. Laurie, thank you so much. And I know that you also contributed to the case studies, which is fantastic when we both know those released as well. Uh, and I know it's early morning for you. So thank you so much for getting up and for joining us. It's, it's very much appreciated. So everyone, this is going to start with a bit of a curated conversation with some reflections on what we've learned through the research. And then uh, I'll open that section up to our wider audience and we'll move through a couple of other sections before we kind of close today. Uh, but I already feel kind of excited about where we're going to take this. I'm going to ask uh, just a kind of light and easy opening question, if I may. Um, and I'm going to come perhaps to... Um, to James and, and Christopher, because I know then he'll have to slip away, and Masood, and, and just asking if you got one takeaway from this research and the role of libraries as partners and leaders in research, what would it be, James? Oh, okay. Um, I, I think the thing that's really struck me is that in challenging circumstances with variable levels of recognition and with kind of uneven um, at least for universities, kind of bureaucratic status of, of librarians. Um, librarians and libraries are already partners in research. Um, and that really stood out for me from the research that was done that went into this report. Um, and that they're getting involved in a range of research. It's not just the classic collections-based research that, you know, um, humanities person and librarian are partners in a project to some extent to access collections they are really getting involved and bringing a range of skills to that research um, and I guess then as someone who works with librarians for me what stood out then was what I can do um, and that people like me probably could do more to embed that where colleagues in the sector want it to be embedded. So, for example, you know, suggesting to colleagues that they could put themselves forward to join um, peer review colleges, for example, if that's something that they wanted to do without me as someone imposing that on my colleagues in the library sector. So that for me really is what stood out. 
Thank you so much, James. There is something really uh, fundamental for me as well about uh, those of us who are library staff. Um, I know there's many different professions represented on this on this call uh, and this session today. Is seizing the space that we can is there for us to walk into, uh, and that's I think I hope this research will be a catalyst to that. Christopher, uh, sorry to sort of call on you, but is anything you want to add at this stage? Um, one of the things that I thought was really fascinating is that section, which is about shifting the shifting perception of the library. Uh, and, it, and it just there's such a, an extraordinary moment uh, right now. Um, so much is changing in arts and humanities, in the way that we conceive of learning, in the way that we conceive of teaching, in the way that we conceive of the openness of research, how it's disseminated. And it, wherever you look anywhere on the research infrastructure or ecosystem or how research uh, engages with, with the rest of the world, Libraries are at the absolute heart of every single part of that conversation, um, whether it be uh, openness of scientific publication, whether it be co-creation of research, whether it be reaching out into making collections more available, whether it be supporting a totally different uh, um, distributed process of teaching and education. None of this is even thinkable without the library. Uh, and I think that just makes for me so absolutely essential that we grasp this time of transformation and look at it in a really positive forward-looking way which is what you're doing and then James points absolutely right those of us who are as it were associated around this need to open the doors further uh, that's the really important thing we need to look at where the blockages are uh, and we need to get them get them out of the way because you are trans you're pushing us rightly, I think, to make openness an absolute hallmark of the way that we approach our funding and our support for the research ecosystem. So fantastic opportunity, but you should be challenging us and that challenge is welcome. Thank you so much. That challenge I think only works if we also seize it. it it's an absolute exchange at the classic uh, heart of this, which matters enormously. And, and thank you um, as well, Christopher, for name checking our colleagues who, who support across the breadth of, of our science community as well you, you know that that call for openness has many interpretations uh, and that certainly is part of the kind of the, the commitment which we we have across academic libraries and national libraries Masood could I bring you in and then I will open up to the kind of wider panel and see if people would like to come in and we have our first person to join the table as well so I'll call her in in a moment Masood thanks Jess um, I'll be quite brief and I was thinking about uh, the fundamental reason for research and absolutely it's important for societal impact, for economic impact, for academic impact, but at, at its very core, research is about generating new knowledge and making new discoveries to happen. And new knowledge and discoveries can only happen when they're built on existing knowledge, expertise, skills, and ideas. And that's what we do. That's what libraries are there for we provide that ecosystem of knowledge, idea, spaces, environments in which that kind of collaborative partnership research can happen. And sometimes we forget that and sometimes we don't emphasize that enough uh, within our institutions and within the research ecosystem. And therefore, I think firstly, I would like to acknowledge that as James was saying, we are already partners. But then because of that, we also notice that there are certain obstacles, certain issues, certain perceptions, and what this report has really wisely done is brought them to, uh, to the front of our eyes and given us recommendations on how we can change some of that in partnership. And I think that's a great step forward. So uh, if, if I have to take something away, it's acknowledging that we are partners and then collaborating to change certain barriers uh, in front of us uh, to, to do this even better. Thank you so much, Masood. I'm going to ask Emily Ropo, who's going to join us at the table. Um, Emily, um, I'll introduce you properly in a moment. I'm just going to open up now uh, while you kind of get yourself sorted on the screen to see if any other panelists want to kind of come in with their kind of, um, you know, takeaway from the research, something, something that kind of really struck you. It might be about barriers. It might be about uh, challenges. It might be about opportunities. Um, anyone want to put their hand up? Then I will come in. It takes a while for people to kind of get used to all the tools on the screen as well, uh, which is to, to say um, that I also felt that, that the issues around perception were acutely important. Uh, and I'm very taken that, you know, you, you can 
we can put barriers in front of ourselves, but we can also take them down uh, and, and work with others to do so. So for me, you know, one of the real takeaways is, is, is the call to action. And we'll come to that a little bit later as we go through the conversation. Uh, Emily, I know you because we work together at Cambridge, but others won't. Would you mind just giving yourself a bit of introduction and, and you know, whether you'd like to come in with a question or, or indeed with a kind of initial set of reflections on, on what you've heard so far? Yes, thank you. Yes. Um, so I'm a research facilitator at Cambridge University Library. So I uh, support staff to put in the applications and have, have actually been active as a researcher on various. I'm really struck um, from working with library staff over a number of years about um, a tendency for staff to sell themselves short when it comes to funding applications and in particular in, in terms of being named on applications it's a question of knowing sort of what is allowed or you know what is possible but also I think it really is a confidence thing um, so I wondered whether the panel collectively had any ideas on what practical steps we could take to challenge the um, feel that they shouldn't be named in applications and you know, what can we actually do to to stop that happening. Thank you, Emily, uh, so much for that uh, provocation and challenge. The sound's a little bit uh, in and out on your call, so I'm going to just pray so that all the audience can hear uh, and put your your um, your challenge to to um, to the panelists. Um, and I don't know, if, Emily, there's anything else you can do at your end. There may not be to kind of improve your sound quality, but uh, just to just to note that. Um, so I think um, Emily, there, kind of really observing uh, what I think comes through the report, but also. So many of us will, will, will see in our own practice, uh, there's a sort of, um, I, I hate to use the word difference, but there's a, there's a there's an anxiety or, or something stopping sometimes when people kind of uh, saying, I, I, I should be named, I should be recognised, I, I should be seen as one of the owners of the uh, process, uh, the delivery and indeed the outcomes of this report. Um, and I know, you know, there are there a couple of uh, recommendations which do speak to this. I wonder if anyone would recognise that um, uh, as a librarian, as a researcher or a funder, um, and whether you would be willing to comment. Anyone willing to put their hands up? Joe. Yeah, I think that really speaks to one of the key issues that we're talking about, which is about culture. And I mean, I think generally speaking, librarians don't necessarily think of themselves as you know, individual researchers ploughing a, a lonely field uh, and you know, being, being that sort of sole point of creativity. We, we work all the time collaboratively, working with other people, supporting them, working together. So th there are some things we can do to challenge those perceptions, both in terms of who we are as librarians uh, and also how we're perceived externally as well and how research is perceived. And so I think that that cultural piece is absolutely essential uh, in this conversation. Uh, thank you, Joe. Christopher. Uh, I, I'll, I'll just say this now, I'm going to hop off, but um, uh, I think Joe's absolutely right, I'm sure. I think the really important thing is that none of us should see ourselves in that mould of the lone researcher ploughing a lonely furrow. It's, it's not a real image of research anymore. Um, it, Ossaline Laser has written about this. It's, it's a really, really key thing for me as well. Clearly, we need to support the researcher as an individual. But we need to understand them within the concept of the teams that are essential for them to, 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 to do what they're doing. So in that way, I think if we can, this is not just about the culture of librarians, it's about the culture of research and really getting across the notion that research is better when it's done with an acknowledgement of expert partnering with everybody who's necessary to make that research as good as it can be. I think that's really, really important. So my, so my answer in part is I'm sure there are things we can do. I'm sure there are things we can do about forms. I'm sure there's things we can do about education. I'm sure there are things we can do about culture, but we should see this as a transformation of the whole way in which we go about research, even in arts and humanities, where the idea of a singleton researcher um, is rightly, I think, being eroded and part of the rightness is making people more aware of the support systems that are necessary for their research. So with that, I hope you have a marvellous time. I'm going to hop off, but thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you so much, Christopher. I really appreciate it. Thank you for everything you've done. Bye-bye. Um, just before I come back in, would anyone else tell? 
Um, thank you, um, Jess and um, Emily. For the for the, the you asked about practical steps um, and practical help that we can give and, and and being the sort of you know administrator and policy wonk on this particular panel I, I will give some practical guidance um, in AHRC's guide, gu guidelines and funding guide I believe it's pages 47 and 48 you'll see that in terms of eligibility there is no barrier to being a named investigator um, if you can demonstrate equivalent professional experience or expertise. Now, we, 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 don't, we don't insist on a PhD, but if it's clear from the project that um, the uh, colleague from the librarian or, or special collection, uh, you know, from, from the library or special collections um, is shaping and formulating and driving the research and the methodology and the approaches, then they are a creator of knowledge or they are leading the creation of knowledge and therefore they are eligible. That's all there is to it. And if any research officer or research grants manager at a university queries that, please send them straight to me and I will read the riot act to them. I love a bit of revolution on a on a, a conference table tower. Thank you so much. Absolutely brilliant uh, as ever. And I always wish we could just sort of podcast you just saying those, those few bits. Uh, brilliant. Um, I think there's something which we might come through through the conversation about language as well, because some of the, 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 the way in which, um, uh, you know, the, the use of the word technical sometimes can be a put off to 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 librarians frame themselves uh, more directly in part of the conversation. We might want to pack that a little bit further as we go through. Uh, can I see if there are any other hands before we kind of move on to our next set of, of reflections? Then I think we'll move on. That's really great. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on now to talking about expectations, which I think we've kind of moved into with that fantastic transition from from Tao and Emily. Um, given uh, that I know your sound wasn't wasn't great, there's nothing to stop you coming back in if you want to or using the the chat. Um, and uh, we have got another question, and hopefully the person who's asked that might feel like comes to the room direct as well. Uh, but while we wait for that to happen, we're going to move into expectations, and I wonder if I can just ask a kind of open question um, about how we might further enhance the role of libraries or archives and museums. We are a broad church at DCDC and I think many of the recommendations do, do flow and translate across the community uh, in which we work. Um, how might we enhance that role that, that, that libraries, archives, museums have of research partners and particularly as leaders of research? What needs to change? We talked a little bit about the perception, we talked a bit about uh, administrative understanding of what the guidelines allow, uh, but I'd be interested from a kind of, uh, from perspective of library researcher or funder, um, how we take that forward um, I wonder if I can just call on Claire and Joe in the first instance of their reflection on, um, particularly as Claire has also been, forgive me a previous chance of research, so you're, you're intimately involved in kind of how you help to kind of build pathways to research. And Joe, as from a national library, uh, albeit not a, uh, um, uh, um, an independent research organisation uh, so classed, whether you've got any reflections on that particular topic. Could I come to Claire first and then to Joe? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, I think one of the things that we we really, I think case studies are extremely important and it, it's great that we've done some case studies as part of this study. I think what a lot of people respond very well to, whether they're um, librarians, uh, collections managers, archivists, or whether they're um, academics, is seeing good practice elsewhere. So seeing exciting things that other people have been doing and maybe as a result thinking, Oh, okay, that sounds interesting. Maybe we could do something like that. Um, or if we can't, what would need to change for us to be able to? So I think that th that is great, but also sometimes inter-institutional um, collaboration where, you know, for example, we know some of the exciting work you're doing um, in digital libraries with, at Cambridge, Jess, and I know that you also collaborate with other universities. And it's that sort of working with people who are already doing some interesting things. and. Um, you know, collaborating across different institutions, I think, is extremely important in that sense of giving people confidence that it is possible, even if our group or our team or our organisation hasn't yet done it, there are other people out there whose expertise we can benefit from. I think the final thing, and this is, this is less inspiring and more gritty, but nevertheless important, is the sense of recognition, formal recognition for doing research. So, 
you know, in the report, we have made recommendations about thinking about um, job responsibilities, job descriptions, job adverts, uh, recognition in terms of progression and promotion in terms of actually doing research. Um, at the moment, you know, that's a, an expected part of most academics contracts unless they're on a teaching only track. Um, but it, it's much rarer in terms of the library. So in effect, we're asking librarians to to do extra work um, in, in what is in effect their spare time. And you can understand why some librarians may not be all that keen to do so, given that people do have perfectly reasonable right to having a private life. Um, so I, I do think that we, we have to think carefully if we want to ask librarians to collaborate in research, as we certainly should, what are we giving back to those librarians in terms of recognition, in terms of the formal job titles um, that, that they can benefit from? As I say, more gritty, less exciting, but nevertheless, just as important, I think. Really important, um, Claire. And just before I come to Joe, could I just kind of ask back of you because you, you are, uh, you know, you are a university senior leader. You've seen it kind of from the top down as well as kind of as you're, you've kind of advanced in your own uh, research profession. Any advice for how we we should be working with the the university senior leadership to to kind of realise some of the goals that you've outlined to kind of grab their attention? Yeah, that's difficult because. Um, those of us in arts and humanities often uh, get libraries uh, in the sense that we, uh, you know, we, we will want to work with special collections and, um, you know, we may even go into a library, heaven knows. Um, sometimes many university senior leaders tend to be um, from sciences and they don't have such a strong perception of what the library does. So I think this is something where it is really, really important that, you know, I, I hate to give you librarians more jobs, but I think it is actually very, very important that the library is in constant dialogue with parts of the senior leadership team, whether that's as, as a member of research committee, for example, um, as perhaps a member of education committee, thinking about what libraries do for education too. But, um, you know, our university librarian, who I know you knew very well, Liz, Liz Waller and I had regular meetings when I was PVCR about research, about what was going on, about, um, you know, new plans, exciting strategies, what might be coming over the horizon, um, equally, you know, developments in open data, open archives, those sorts of things. So it, it, it can be, and I think it has to be a two-way dialogue and it has to be that sort of, as I say, I hate to give librarians more work, but you know where I've seen this kind of thing work really well, it also worked really well at UCL with um, the senior leadership team being very plugged into um, the library. In that case, actually, um, David Price, um, actually, I, I believe, line manages the library. So that's another way of doing it. But it has to be this sense of dialogue and collaboration. And if that starts at the top, um, then there is a sense of encouraging research and recognizing the con contribution of the library in kind of active collaboration. So I, I really think that that's extremely important. And, you know, maybe I, I, it's this question about confidence again. I think librarians should be absolutely confident in their role of going along to senior leaders and saying, hey, look, you know, this is what we're doing. We're doing really good stuff. You can't live without us. And this is why. That's fantastic, Claire. Um, being um of service, which I think is honourable, does not also discount being a partner or being a leader or indeed in selling what we're doing. Uh, let me come to Joe, who's had the benefit of working in university as well as in national library settings. And Joe, give you a chance to kind of come. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd agree with everything that Claire's just said. I think more of these case studies will really help us define what that library research space looks like. Uh, and I do think it's important you know, we have good examples of what, what we are talking about here. We're, we're not setting up to compete with academics. I think that's, that's really important. Uh, so I mean, have, having more of these stories, whether it's about conservation science or histories of collections and provenances, digital scholarship, there's some real good things we've done with the scientific community as well that we should showcase and so I think that, that that clarification will be really valuable for us. Another thing that I think would really enhance uh, where we are is, is just changing some of the written rules and some of the unwritten rules as well. Um, so I mean, with my current hat on at the National Library of Scotland we're not an independent research organisation that does limit what we can do 
So I mean, some you know, probing and perhaps changing around that would be very valuable for us. And I know for other organisations that are research, active and research committed as well. Um, but I think there are also unwritten rules. So th thinking back to when I was in higher education, uh, it, there's an unwritten rule that academics don't go and work with their own collections. Uh, you, you need to go and work with somebody else's collection because that's where you get the impact and the, and the, the engagement. Uh, and so you have this strange situation where university libraries are building up fantastic collections um, but but your own academics are not necessarily that interested so i mean there's there's something there where, you know, where I, I think a bit of probing and some again some further case studies could be really valuable and i suppose the final thing is more money always helps joe money is power isn't it it helps to get things done so i, I absolutely and, and and the kind of the professional uh, practice fellowships is a, is a brilliant intervention. Uh, I'm going, uh, there's a number of ways in which we're going to move next to this conversation, um, but I would like to come to Laurie, um, uh, because so, so pleased she's joined us. Uh, and though the case study is not yet released, I know she's got a really powerful one. And Laurie, I wonder if you could sort of build on what you've heard and perhaps speak as well to kind of how, you know, opportunities and how you can enhance in international collaboration around research. So really great discussion and um, really great headline uh, findings already where the two things that I would really point out for enhancing international collaboration are know that folks are interested in collaborating and that everyone should know that we have expertise to bring and that our work is awesome. We're really important researchers and collaborators. Um, in addition to that, just knowing who we are and, and what we want is really important. We need to be able to claim our expertise. Uh, from feminist situated perspective, we need to know where we are in the world in order to be able to work with others, to amplify them, to help activate our communities and our collaborations, and to be accountable. You know, we have all of the, we have the authority and the responsibility, and we need to embrace that in order to best engage in collaboration. So when I'm looking at new collaborators or people that kind of have nebulous, like, well, I'd like to work with someone else on something, I ask them, what are you, you, you uniquely positioned to work on? And that's your institution, that's you as a person, that's your team. What things do you bring to the table that no one else has or that you're just particularly great at? Also, what do you love? of this, what really inspires you? What's your passion? Collaboration is hard. International collaboration is harder. Um, so what is really gonna be fulfilling and joyous to you? And what's gonna do the and, and, and? You know, um, it's so often as researchers like, okay, so you're gonna do the research, you're gonna present on it, you're gonna publish on it, are you gonna teach a class on it? It's already so much work. So how do you get that extra mileage out of it? And also really that depth of engagement. So what is this collaboration going to do for you? Um, it's also interesting and I'm seeing in the chat some of the questions on like the technician comment. Some of the, the things for international collaboration, some of our different ways of framing the world are really useful. Um, in the US, we often talk about team science. And so if you have a big research team, you know, you have 100 high energy physicists working on something, you need a research facilitator. You need someone who just helps make sure everything moves through. Um, who's your person on the supercomputing? Um, who's your person doing this other instrumentation? And all of those super specialized, maybe it's only one person on the team, maybe it's four, that's really, really important. And so as librarians, we can see ourselves as like our, you know, supercomputing colleagues, um, like our other instrumentation experts. So yeah, just emphasize in knowing that our work is awesome um, and that people wanna collaborate. Uh, thank you so much, Laurie. And I know we will be publishing your case study. I wonder if you can just give us anything practical about how the particular, you know, I know you've got a case study going forward. In that case study, how did that international collaboration start? Some of the international collaborations, like the Digital Library of the Caribbean started uh, before I, I was engaged with it. Um, it was really interesting. So the University of Florida is landlocked. Um, it's in North Florida. It's in a swamp. Um, so it's more protected from hurricanes. Um, it's still super swampy. So we have the same environmental concerns. Um, the university has always identified since its founding as a Caribbean institution. So you have partnerships that date back over 80 years. Um, and those were, you know, how do we have joint collecting and paper? And then also, how do we do it with microfilming? So they had librarians from the University of Florida on boats, sailing around microfilming materials, partners got a copy, University of Florida got a copy, and then the digital age comes. Okay, um, and so from that, you know, in terms of uniquely positioned, like, okay, we are a Caribbean institution, we have these many generations of collaboration, um, how do we really amplify that? And so the question was, let's build a digital library that's for us and that's by us, all the Caribbean partners working together. And then let's also make sure that it does something else. So we wanna make sure that we have preservation and access and what else can we do with it? How else can we embed this in teaching? What other research can we enable? And so coming into that beloved community, that generous community, um, and then really getting to see all of that engagement and then getting to amplify it 
And then you get to have, I get to have the Digital Library of the Caribbean as an example for other things. We can talk about it as a repository. We can talk about it as the and, and, and. We can talk about it as a generous community. What does that generosity mean and how we fuel research and we fuel community? Laura, that's fantastic. Uh, and I, in a completely um, uh, low level way, I'm just gonna say Christopher gave us the concept of paradise uh, as being a library. You've given us, uh, extended that with paradise being a library on a boat, which sounds absolutely amazing in the Caribbean. So, you know, thank you. Um, we have got a number of kind of questions circling through the chat, um, which I know not everyone can see, but uh, around kind of exploring this term of technician. So as the final part of our section is about actions, um, and as one of the recommendations that uh, comes through uh, the headlines of the report is kind of exploring uh, the, the potential to be framing uh, the benefits and understanding what's, what's come out through the technician's commitment uh, and the way in which uh, technician uh, might be unpacked as a term uh, to be more encompassing, then I think we're going to just spend a little bit of time sort of exploring that landscape because I think it's a really uh, urgent important one uh, some of the comments in the chat have, have sort of you know uh, you know we don't always think of ourselves in that way within the library archive and museum community some will some won't uh, but is that self, self a barrier and I think uh, Lisa if you don't mind me mentioning a name and I'm not you know no, you're not going to come into the call uh, Lisa Collinson has said you know particularly interested in the connotations of the term technician and potential dissonance between that as being also being a leader and I think those are those are those are worth working through and commenting on and uh, Tao I wonder if I could call you just to from from a from a funder perspective um your take on this okay um i'll try not to be too long-winded because i like many i suspect um in the audience and 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 on this call i i have issue with the with the term technician myself because it is it requires so much unpacking that by the time you've got to the end of it you sort of lost sight of what it's all about in the first place well there's a risk of that we're using the, word, the term technician commitment because that is the name of the of, of, of the, the document or the commitment that we signed up to um, as an organization, as UKRI, as an organization signed up to. Um, and, and after we'd signed up to it, there was a lot of um, sort of agonizing and head scratching and, 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 and uh, sort of soul searching about what the word technician meant in the arts and humanities concept, in, in context, and in the context of, of, of collections. Um, and I should say that AHRC is the sort of home research council for all collections, regardless of your of the discipline, because you know, today's um, medical samples will be tomorrow's collection. And that's just the way it is. Um, we couldn't change the 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 the, the name of the te you know of technician commitment. It was there. It came to us as it was, ready made. Um, but what we would want to sort of stress, I suppose, is that the the purpose of signing up to it was to lift barriers, not to create more barriers. Was to um, you know to to encourage greater participation in research. Um, and greater inclusivity in the research ecosystem, not to um, not to reiterate or, or, or reinforce barriers. Um, and the principle behind it was that research and innovation happens in many spheres and in many places, and that they all deserve equal recognition. So that that was the spirit of the technician commitment. And that was the spirit that we signed up to. We signed up to it in spirit more than we did um, in letter, I have to say. Um, so when we came to sort of looking at what the supposed technician community um, consisted of within arts and humanities, we took a very broad view. And, 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 and essentially we decided that, you know, there were a lot of, research active constituents and individuals across the arts and humanities community, and they were not being sufficiently or appropriately recognized. Their research, their methodologies, their approaches, what they brought, what they enabled in terms of how we, um, how, how we addressed particular research questions was not being recognized. It was all being tucked under, you know, some sort of support, academic support, research support, you know, sat in IT services, in libraries, in collections, and, and, and you know, curators tended to be um, conceived as people who put things in cases or fiddled with things in storage. And librarians were seen as people who sort of wheeled trolleys of books around and, and then put them on the shelves or fetched and carried. It was 
essentially an unfair and uneven landscape. So the whole sort of driving force behind this particular exercise, which is the start of what I hope will be a sea change in our approach to recognizing and celebrating research, was that anybody who can, you know, who's clearly recognized within their own field or their community as a creator or generator of new knowledge and is clearly engaged in innovation, they should be recognized as you know, and, and, their, and, their, and their research and their contribution should be recognized on its own terms, not shoehorned into some other um, sort of academic construct, um, which, um, you know, they might not sit very easily in. Um, so, so that was the, that was, that was the, the you know, the, the, the term technician commitment and the term technician, I understand, is very loaded and, and, and very um, um, sort of difficult and needs a lot of unpacking. But the spirit behind it is, is, was to lift the blocks um, and, 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 and lower the boundaries and to encourage and celebrate greater inclusivity. That's what we hope we're doing. Is that helpful? Really helpful. And I think I think acknowledging and I think as our UK, we, we can as well. that There are certain loaded uh, associations with that term, but that shouldn't uh, stop us from kind of exploring under the um, intent and spirit of that commitment, what the opportunities are for kind of further expanding and recognising the role. And that's really helpful. To, I think that acknowledgement is, is really there. Um, just before I move on to our final uh, question, I'll just see if anyone on the panel wants to come in on that uh, point around technician language or um, commitment. There's no obligation to task spoke to it really well. In which case, I think we will move on to our final section where we've kind of got room for a kind of couple of comments. Um, uh, and, um, and perhaps I'll come to Masood first. Uh, I think we're really interested um, in just sort of finalizing uh, in response to the kind of recommendations that are there, the kind of call to action, uh, what we might take forward as individuals or as institutions uh, or as a community. And I think Masood, you were, you were thinking of some practical steps within the institution as a, as a, kind, of a, a kind of part of the wrap up. So can I come to you first? Thank you. And um, I, I think this would sound quite boring, but nonetheless, I think there are very tangible things that we can take um, as, as actions. Um, I think the first thing we, we can do is to involve and empower our staff to be part of the research conversations and opportunities. So as librarians or university librarians or director of library and archives in those kind of positions, we are often privileged to join research and innovation boards or research committees. And I think what we need to do is to start involving more people from within the libraries in that kind of conversation and those kind of opportunities that are spoken about so that that early collaborative partnership spirit starts building up. The other tangible thing I was thinking about was to start talking more with research offices and start breaking these perceptions of you are on a professional services contract, you can't be a co-I or a PI. And in reality, that has happened in, in a past role where I was basically told you can't be because you're a professional contract person. And I know how that, that really gets to you, but it, it is an unfortunate reality. And I think there is a tangible action that we need to do to change that and to really bring people back into the fold of, no, that's not true. And then the third one is um, to enable libraries to be part of research uh, debate as a whole. So not just collections, but also our spaces. Also, uh, I think I, I was reading Fabi's comment earlier in, in the chat about um, the data analytics skills, uh, the kind of data uh, science skills that the, the library workforce now has or will have in the future and bringing them into the fold of the discussion as well. So uh, that's what I, I think I thought I would give my three tangible things to do. Really great. And I'm delighted that Claire Warwick is going to come in at this point as well, Claire. Sure, I'm conscious of the time, so I'm, I'm going to keep this relatively short. I mean, Masood's suggestions are extremely positive. I, I think one thing I might add in terms of thinking about research offices is not only in terms of, you know, there's the um, details of costing out proposals, but also um, we heard from one of your research facilitators earlier on, research facilitators are really important and their knowledge is key in terms of making connections between different parts of the organisation. 
So I think one of the things that's going to be really important in future is that we do make sure that our research facilitation colleagues are very aware of what libraries are doing and you know the exciting things that are going on in libraries because they may not be at the moment and I think if they were then we might get more kind of proactive suggestions of where an academic might not necessarily think to work with a library colleague but a research facilitator who's aware of the skill set um, that the librarians do have and that perhaps other exciting work that they've been doing can help to make those connections. Yeah, that was great. Um, I, I feel like we could carry on talking, but I'm going to draw us to a close. And I think those kind of call to practical actions were a fantastic place to kind of finish because this is not just about the theory. It's not just about having evidence. It's about what we do next. Um, and just to picking up on some of those practical aspects and response in the chat around the role of research offices, um, uh, HSE are planning some house training for research facilities and managers around kind of this which I think will be tremendously helpful and certainly for me in my role I will be thinking about how we position uh, talking about the report and its finding with our purpose transfer for research and with our director of research office as well as you know sharing it with my community uh, within the, the 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 libraries of Cambridge to talk about how we tell our story better and how we position ourselves and what the actions we can take so I am just going to really finish by saying a huge thank you uh, this has been um, a, 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 a genuinely thought-provoking um, session with contributions from um, our, our uh, introductory speakers Christopher Smith um, um, Pete Dalton, who was behind the research, of course, uh, and all of our panellists to whom um, I owe a huge debt of thanks. Also to our audience members, um, Amelie was brave enough to come onto the screen, others weren't, but that's absolutely fine. What you did was kind of contribute to the chat and, and uh, we, we've kept your attention throughout. Uh, so thank you so much for your patience. I, I've really loved it. Uh, this has been one of the most exciting uh, parts of, of my RLUK life um, as a board member uh, in, and to see the kind of practical applications of that uh, working in continued close partnership with, with the HRC, but also with our research community. You know, the possibilities are great. So it's a conversation that continues. So my thanks to everyone who's taken part in this call. Um, I have a, a, um, a really kind of a brief uh, a bit of kind of housekeeping. One is just to remind you that in, uh, in uh, July we'll be publishing the full report and the headlines and of course that'll be uh, circulated fully on social media and for other forums so there'll be a chance to kind of engage again have a conversation uh, through those channels.